So picture this. You're young, good looking, and everyone tells you you have what it takes to make in this country. Some people don't have access to the basics like healthcare, education, housing. Some suffer from mental illness, live in fear of gangs and law enforcement. Substance abuse and the environment are both preventable social issues. Climate change is no joke, people. Drink more water. Do we as a country have what it takes for a better tomorrow? Watch Tomorrow Pictures on Film On. Here I am, there you'll be, miles and miles This is Tomorrow Pictures TV. Um, so if you do not know, I am Casey Sullivan, owner of Curating Confidence, and we do a monthly conversation and Q&A here, uh, a collaboration with Zach Knight and uh, ATL Vet, or yes, ATL Vets for Advancing the Line, um, helping veteran-owned small businesses uh, as a small business owner, and just really trying to collaborate with the community, veteran or non-veteran, bringing people together, and sharing stories, sharing wisdom, sharing knowledge in lots of different fields. Uh, I own a uh, business called Curating Confidence. So just as said, I focus on all things self-confidence with a flair of fashion behind it. So um, I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. I don't know, I think this might be, do we have any veterans in the room? Veterans, veterans? How about veteran supporters? Woo! Awesome. So we really appreciate everybody that does their part in getting us these opportunities to do stuff like this. So big shout out to Nate with Social Pro Video. He is the guy behind all the magic on camera and of course the sound. And then of course Kimber our lovely lady that's serving us and keeping us happy. Make sure to take care of her, please, and thank you. Shout out to Six Bridges Brewery for allowing us to use this space to do this. We are very humbled by the generosity with everybody. Um, so to get kick-started, I have this fabulous guest. I caught off guard because he's adjusting his collar, so I'll give him a moment. Da, 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 da. Don't pay attention, no. Um, but I have this fabulous guest I'm gonna introduce in a moment. But with my background in fashion, coming from the film industry, in fashion, doing costume, wardrobe design, and styling, personal styling, individual, all that, and his background also in film, we had a very quick and very unique connection. And when we get together, it becomes a little like, when are they gonna stop talking? So I promise I kept notes for myself so I'd stay on track tonight, just for your sake. Um, but I, I wanted to have this conversation tonight because as I mentioned, although I do fashion, I want everything in your life to build confidence for you and not to exclude that in fashion. Fashion is one of those things that often creates a vortex of dislike of questioning yourself, of wondering if you are enough or if you're too much of something. And I wanna make sure that people feel empowered to embrace themselves utilizing this amazing tool of fashion. And connected deeply with fashion is the film industry. And so I wanted to have this conversation about the crossroads the, of fashion, film, and culture and how they shape our world around us and how they shape our self-image. So without further ado, Frederick Taylor, Emmy award-winning filmmaker. <laughs> um, I will let him give his own little introduction because I will never do it justice. But what I do want to say of that is when you think of somebody in film, you don't often think of somebody with heart and soul. And this guy, and I'll let him kind of dive into as much as he wants to share on the background of how he got where he is. But his whole film journey is about sharing stories of humanity and bringing us together. Social justice, or whatever you want to call it. But the idea of saying we can be diverse and we can not understand things, but we can care and we can love and we can show up as humans. So I'm gonna let you take it away. I would love for you to tell them as much or as little because I don't feel like it's my story to divulge too much. 
<laughs> to, to share kind of what your background is, how you got to where you are today, Frederick Taylor, guys. Well, this is great. Um, this is a lot of fun uh, as well. I'm happy to be here. Um, so I think the first thing I'd like to do, is there anybody that wants to ask me a question before I tell them about myself? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody have an immediate question? Okay, so no, not you. Um, but um, I'm gonna continue on now. So, I'm like everybody else. You know, I grew up with um, parents and living in a neighborhood and going to high school and college and all of the other fun stuff as well. Uh, the thing that I did was I tried to live my life as a journey. And the thing that I did was I accepted the fact that I was going to make mistakes and make a lot of mistakes. And I just constantly tried to roll with it. And that's how I found my way into being a filmmaker. I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I want to be a filmmaker. Oh, I want to be part of social justice and things like that. I just slowly evolved into a level of awareness um, that I had a sense of duty to other people. So I was always the weird kid that would protect the other kids in the schoolyard from getting beaten up by the bully and stuff like that. So I just always had this sense of equity and um, fair play as, as well. And I was fortunate enough to be around a lot of people that were empowered and from both genders as, as well, which was extraordinarily important. And it's one of the things that I'm gonna stress as we continue on talking uh, th this evening as, as well. I, I think it's really important for us to do away with these constructs of like, these are boys, these are girls, and these are two separate worlds. Um, we live in a world now where everything's about from the neck up. You know, and we need to come to terms with that and realize that. And I've been fortunate enough to travel around the world and see many different countries and many different cultures. And I will say this, every culture in the world that is ascending, women are given an equal part and an equal role and an equal say in society. Every culture that is disseminating and having conflict and issues and problems, they are oppressing women. Um, that's a particular soapbox that I'm willing to get on and I will fight you in the parking lot on uh, as, as, as well because I think it's extraordinarily um, important. So my background started in art, music, dance, um, painting, drawing, things like that. And then I went to college, I wanted to be a journalist and then that turned into being a documentary filmmaker because I started to feel very strongly about a lot of issues involving people. And that momentum I took into graduate school and I realized very quickly in life that if I wanted to do what I wanted to do, I was gonna have to work for myself and I was gonna have to figure this out. So that's the path that I went down. And I started as a company, it started in my dorm room, then it moved over into my apartment, and then it moved over into a one room office, and then it turned into a two room office, and then a three room office. And now I have a big office, and it's in Buckhead. And I sit on the board of governors at the Buckhead Club, and even that was an accident. You know, I stumbled into that. Somebody thought it'd be a good idea if I go hang out at the Bucket Club and then I'm hanging out at the Bucket Club and then someone thought it'd be a good idea that I sit on the board of governors um, is, is well. And the best part about it is I get to be my authentic self. And I can't stress that enough. And then when you're your, your authentic self, when you have problems, you have issues, that you, you fall down, you fall on your face, you make mistakes or whatever, you have your scrapes, that's okay. You're not in this game to try to be perfect. You're in this game to try to be you. And that's probably the biggest thing that I want to be able to talk about and stress in, in, within the construct of you know, curating confidence and things like that. I think sometimes we, we mistake that for being that I've got to be perfect. You know, I want to be like those great self-help gurus that are out there and they look perfect. Everything's working out for them. I want to be like that. No, that's not real. What's real is the life that you're living and it's your ability to react to issues and react to conflict and to react to these trials and tribulations that we all have and we all make mistakes. But we have the ability to always at any particular time pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off and continue on with our journey. 
as well. So, was that good? Should I stop talking then? I'm gonna give you the microphone back. I might take it otherwise. No, I have plenty of questions, I promise. So, coming from that, and I, I lied, I'm gonna divulge a little bit that he didn't divulge there and hope he doesn't kill me later. No, so, coming from the south side of Chicago, and, 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 and working in Hollywood, and now owning your own film company, Tomorrow Pictures, by the way, guys, I forgot to announce that earlier, um, here in Atlanta, and, and having the success that you've seen in the film world, and in other areas of life, as a person, as a filmmaker, sharing real stories of real people, coming from the background that you've had, and, and even from like Hollywood and the music background and that industry being a very different world, how did that shape your self-image and keep you grounded into what you're doing now? Well, initially it crippled it <laughs> because I grew up in the hip hop era and you saw people that were extraordinarily successful. Um, for those of you that remember the 90s, Okay, so one of the things you remember about the, the, the 1990s was that a lot of people made a lot of money and they did a lot of stuff. And there were a lot of super, 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 super famous people. And I think you could say late 80s, 90s, early 2000s, where it was just sort of ridiculous. And that was the standard. You had to be uber important, uber rich, uber powerful, uber pretty, and uber everything. And if you fell short of that, you were nobody. And that was one of the things that I had to really work out for myself. I remember I was doing a uh, video for Russell Simmons. He had a TV show called One World Music Beat. And I was his cameraman for the Southeast. And um, his host was his ex-wife, the tall one, it was really attractive. I can't remember her name anymore. Um, anyway. So, uh, Kimora, yes, Kimora Lee Simmons, yes. Um, wow, that's a thing, girl, okay. So, but one of the things that, um, you know, I discovered about being in that particular world where, you know, I would be doing things like I'd interview, you know, she would be interviewing, I'd be shooting, and it would be Elton John or these other famous people and things like that where I had to come to terms with where I was in my life and what I was doing and that that still had value and that I can't spend a lot of time chasing that. So we did this interview with Chris Tucker once. I mean, we, we, we shot Puff Daddy, we did it all. And so there was this one interview with Chris Tucker and Chris Tucker just became fixated with me because he noticed that I was doing everything but I wasn't saying too much. I was, I was actually doing my job which if anyone has ever worked in the hip hop industry is weird. No one does their job. Everyone is posing and everyone is just like, you know, flossing I think is the term that they use. Stunting, exactly. Exactly. And so I was actually working and he thought that was the weirdest thing in the world. He was just like, oh my God, you know, what's wrong with you, man? Like, you know, it was like really weird. <laughs> and, um, he came over to me and he, of course he yelled it because he yells everything. He never speaks quietly, it's really awkward. Um, and he says, Fred, why are you on the low, low all the time? You're always on the low, low, I don't understand. And I had this moment where I was like, oh my God, he's so right, I'm on the low. I'm like sort of operating below the frequency of what everybody else is doing. You know, how am I going to make it in this business if I am not flossing and, and stunting? And how do you do that? I have no idea. I just know how to work hard and do the best job I possibly can. And that's when I realized that, you know, the industry that I was in at that particular time, doing the best job that you possibly can doesn't mean anything to anybody. So I was in the wrong industry. <laughs> So I needed to shift and I needed, to, um, I needed to, to pivot. And it was important that I did that and that I didn't spend all this time chasing the dragon in that universe. Even though I worked with everybody, it was around everybody. It was like TLC, Arrested Development, it was like Tony Braxton, Usher, all these people. And I just floated through, but it wasn't what I wanted. 
and I had to come to terms with who I was versus what was going on around me. Fast forward now, I've stayed myself. Now a lot of these people circle back around and they want me to help them. Does anyone know who David Banner is? Right, okay, so David Banner um, comes to me and he says, I wanna be an actor and I need you to help me. I need you to coach me on how to be an actor. I have an opportunity to be in this film. The, the butler, he plays um, the husband of Mariah Carey in The Butler, but he knows nothing about acting. So I have to teach him how to, you know, do his scene essentially. And it was so weird. And it's because I'm like, this is David Banner and he's an idiot. And is that on tape? <laughs> and I have to coach him. And I, it, was, it was such an interesting dynamic that here he is and he's super famous, but for him to go to the next level, I'm teaching him how to be authentic. I'm teaching him how to be himself. He had become so submerged in his sort of hip hop alter ego that he, had no, he did not know how to harness his true self in order to play a character. And the character he was playing was a husband whose wife has been abused or assaulted. And he has to react to it, but he's powerless to do anything about it. This was a, a, a level of emotion and feelings that he's never explored or thought about in his entire life, let alone read about or anything. And it was really fascinating to have to coach somebody through that type of dynamic. Um, you know, it, it's, been ha it's happened many times for me now where people have, that are famous have circled back and they call me and they want to talk to me about how to do something. Um, Brian Barber, who is the guy that directed the Hey Ya video for Outcast. You know, during the pandemic, there's Brian, he's sitting in my office in the chair across from me at my desk. And anyone that's coming to my office has knows sitting in that chair and what it's like to have to talk to me across that desk. And he's trying to figure out his career, you know, because his career has, you know, taken a very strange turn and he's trying to figure out how to make his career better. And so, the point of these stories is it's just, I know in the beginning, in the short term, it seems like being yourself kind of sucks, but being yourself in the long run, you'll win and you win every single time. It's like being, you know, working with a fitness person like my friend Taylor here, you know, and, and Taylor can really speak to this. It's like when they first start out and you're like, okay, I need you to give me 10 reps and they can do three and you're pushing them to say, no, like, you've got to keep going. Like, you, you, okay, you can do three today. Next week, maybe you'll do five. The week after that, maybe you get seven. You know, a month from now, two months from now, maybe you get to 10. It, it, you, you've got to see, you've got to do something that prepares yourself for your future self in the bigger picture. And you, you have to believe. And, and, and that's the, really the key element in being success and to me and to curating content or not content, confidence is believing in yourself that whatever you are in that moment, you, you, your, your boyfriend, you just broken up or your best friends just, you know, stabbed you in the back or you just failed a test in school or whatever, whatever you are in that low moment that you still believe in yourself that you believe that inherently there is something inside of you that says, I belong, I deserve to be here. I was born and therefore I live, therefore I can continue to move forward and succeed. And that's the thing that makes all of the difference in the world. I mean, it's some of the things that we've talked about as well, living and dying in Los Angeles. And if you go to Los Angeles, you will live and you will die. There is no question about it. Um, but, the, but you have to maintain this strong sense of self or you will be, you know, carved up. I lived in the same neighborhood as Brittany Murphy and I remember the day that they carried her in a body bag out of her house. And there was someone that was like super successful, but without that lack, and I don't know how many of you know that 
the story, but she had a, she didn't have a lot of belief in self and it didn't matter. All of the money in the world and all of the success in the world did not bring her the happiness that she desired. And that happiness is always there in the beginning. It's like you're always Dorothy with the red ruby slippers on the whole time. And you have to remember that. And people forget that. And we live in a society of massive amounts of distractions that keep you from doing anything but focusing on yourself. So that's why, you know, when you go down these rabbit holes of your phone and streaming and, you know, talking to the wrong people, you know, you're not paying attention to yourself, a focus on yourself. And again, you know, I'm just using Taylor because, you know, she works with people in the fitness world. It's like, you've got to focus. Stay here, stay in the moment, do the reps. That will get you through. It may not feel like it's gonna do anything for you now, but it will, you guarantee, it will do something for you later. The same way that you build your physical self, you can build your mental and emotional and spiritual self uh, as, as well. That's my long answer. I'll make it short. So as you can see, he is a wealth of information and he just answered like nine of my questions in one. So you're a rock star. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm kidding. But what I, I wanna circle back around on is, is that confidence piece, is that self image piece, because it is so vital that you develop it from a place of authenticity, that you aren't pulling your confidence, that you aren't pulling your self image from an external variable that you are grounding it in your belief and your values and then whatever happens in your external because externals aren't promised, they change, they shift, they develop and you can't guarantee them. So if your confidence and your self image is built on only the external, which our culture tends to uh, precipitate <laughs> as it's pouring down rain, um, it, like, we need to stay focused on how to truly develop that self-confidence on the internal, on the pieces of your beliefs in yourself and the beliefs of your core values and leaning in on that because in the end, that's all you have left. Um, so taking it back to cultural influence in film and fashion, I kind of want to talk about, this is, this is our realm, me fashion, him film and kind of the blur of the lines, right? But understanding that in film and in fashion, there's a lot of pull and there's a lot of inspiration from outside culture. And there's a lot of influence within those crafts, within the art from outside culture. And yet it is also film, fashion are highly impactful in how our culture views itself and how we view ourselves. So I would love to hear kind of your impression on how you can take something like fashion and film and develop self-image and how you can navigate that in a more positive way versus going down what we just talked about, losing yourself in the moment. Thank you Eminem for that. I just wanted to sneak in the Eminem reference in this. Fashion is everything. Fashion is where it starts. Fashion is the, one of the first things that you interact with that you say, oh my God, there's a bigger, larger world out there because there you are, you're a little kid and you're going through a magazine. That might be your mom's magazine. I remember I used to plow through my mom and my grandmom's magazines all the time because they had a lot of like um, women's magazines and stuff like that. And um, like uh, social magazines, you know, what was going on in society. My, my grandmother was really into Hollywood stuff and my mother was really into uh, women and people that were on the move and moving forward and it was all the clothes. And that was one of the first things that I really started to notice. And then once you start to notice the clothes, you start to notice the colors, you start to notice the context, then you start to notice how people are wearing their hair and what they're looking like. And this kind of determines and starts to set your sort of normative standard for this is what I want to be like. And then it starts when you go to school and you might not like what you're wearing, but then you'll see somebody else at school that's wearing something that you really like. And then you're like, oh, I want that. And then you go to the mall and you buy it or you see something in a music video. For those of you that remember music videos, that was another standard where you would see things that you would want. You know, I actually, and I'm embarrassed, I bought a thriller jacket. <laughs> and I still have it somewhere, it's hanging in a closet. 
um, and it was just, it was, <laughs> yes, it would. It totally would. No, actually, that's an interesting point. No, you, you could actually get away with it. You could probably totally get away with it. But it was true. I mean, I saw it. I saw it in a music video, and I was like, I want to have that. And I had to have that. And I went out, and I saved my money, and then I bought it. Exactly. You know, you, you see these things that you start to identify with as you build your identity. You know, whether that's like, you know, you really like the punk scene and you start dressing punk or whatever, you have to build an identity. And then from building that identity, then you start down this pathway of who I am and what is my art. That's why when you go and you hang out at an art school, all the kids have an identity. They all have something that they have latched onto as far as fashion is concerned to express who they are that creates the path for them to be able to be who they eventually want to become as, as well. And so those things are, are super fascinating. So, so that's kind of a, a, a connection point. Oh, here's a question. Yes, I did. How old are you? Oh my God. There was, there was two. Ooh, wait, okay, you mean in Thriller. I thought he wore the same jacket all the way through. Are you thinking, are you merging two videos? He's in a Thriller jacket. Oh, in the beginning, the whole before the, the oh, right, before it leaps, it, it breaks the fourth wall and it leaps into the movie theater. Yes, you're right. You are correct, sir. Thank you. Yes. Once Michael Jackson turns into the wolf and he's chasing Ola Ray through the woods and then he's getting ready to eat her, then it cuts to the movie theater and then he's wearing the thriller jacket. Yes, and then he has to walk her home and then he turns into the thriller and he does the, the dance that's still really good. That's terrifying, by the way. That is amazing. I wanted you to tell me that you were like a, a background actor or something like that. I, I, that you were a background actor, that you were actually in it. No. Of course. Thank you all, thank you. Um, so, fashion and identity. Fashion has transformed over the millennia. You think about big eras, the flappers. We talked about this kind of a little bit yesterday, and I think it's a great conversation. The flappers, the poodle skirts, the um, hippie era, like the, all these things. There is so much influence of fashion in our culture, in our lives. How do you feel like fashion kind of shapes our identities, about our image, about our bodies, about the world around us? And how can you kind of control some of that? I think Kanye controls it too much, obviously. That's a good example of it going over the top. But yeah, it's the, I mean, you, you can't move forward without some sort of identity about what you look like. And even if you are famous now, people write about you and they say they saw you on a runway or a carpet or whatever, and you didn't look good, people are gonna say something. And of course, famous people, when they're standing there, they say, what are you wearing this evening? And it's like, well, this is Oscar de la Renta. And like, but that's the world we live in. That, that is how our identities are, are built, that is locked into our culture and there's nothing we can do about it. And if you have to go to any particular important event, you better look good. Because you're not gonna get away with looking busted, as the kids like to say. It's not gonna work. Maybe. That's not aging well on him. And I think that uh, Selena Gomez is now beginning to outdistance him and it looks like he made a mistake in his life. Okay, so. That's true, so Justin's gonna come after me. Justin, David Banner, who else did I trash? I trashed somebody else too, I think. Um. <laughs> Yo man, I don't appreciate you like saying that stuff on that video, I saw it on YouTube. 
fashion is important and it's from decade to decade to decade and it does create a certain um, identity and what it, it, it puts you in a position to feel empowered in order for you to move on and become your best self as, as, as well. And the, what do you do with that identity that you create from the way that you present? And that's the key ingredient here, present. We all get up every day, we look in the mirror and we decide this is how I want to present. And presentation can become politicized as well. If you don't present in the way that society has developed these normative, so-called normative standards for how you to present, do you have the courage to continue to push through that as well? And certain people do. RuPaul is a really good example of that as, as well. And that's to be admired. He gets up every day and he decides for himself, this is how I want to present. And he does it. And he builds the attitude behind it. That's where the, the fierceness comes from or the undeniability. Who, no one's gonna tell me no. And I think that that's extraordinarily important as, as well. And at times that's something that's missing from a lot of people. They crumble, you know? They don't know how to necessarily stand up for themselves. And it starts with your fashion and how you want to um, present. You know, Billie Eilish is another really good example of that too. Um, Elliot Page is a tremendous example of that. You know, um, Elliot made a huge decision in his life to present differently and to move and change altogether. And Elliot is much happier versus being the person that everybody else wanted Elliot to be as well. And so these sort of normative standards are something that come into your choices with, with fashion and self-confidence too. Did that help? Okay, good. Because fashion is my space, you know I'm adding something. this okay so um, for those of you on camera if you couldn't hear him he asked um, Frederick had mentioned that fashion is a way for identity for you to find your identity for you to showcase your identity and for somebody like a Steve Jobs who talked about only wearing like the same uniform every day how that was an identity and so, so this is what I coach on and what I teach on and on, on all the things so I'm taking this question from you I'm sorry uh, I, I what I want to really hone in on the point here is that fashion is a very powerful tool but fashion is a commodity it's what you buy style is what you do with it and everybody should understand that the style they present with is the message they are putting out to the world and you get to choose and you get to be in control of that message but so often people are unintentional they haven't been taught to think about it or they don't know how to present and therefore their message gets to be out of their control and what we can never do is we can never choose how people perceive us but if we establish our message in self-confidence that we have already I have already stated that I believe comes from grounding yourself in your belief systems in your values and who you are on the internal versus the external then it becomes such a powerful tool of projection versus a mask or an armor you're wearing out in the day and that is how I think clothing becomes such a piece of powerful presentation. And there's a way, and people will judge you on it. We are an image-based culture. It's not even something that we're doing to be petty or unkind. Usually it's subconscious. But I, coming from a professional world, um, talking to, I have a lot of clients in like the engineering space. If they don't present a certain way subconsciously, they're not going to get the bosses that they, the promotions they want. You come to work sloppy, unironed clothes, your boss is subconsciously gonna say they don't pay attention to details, therefore do I trust their calculations? 
and, and it's, it's, a, it's a scientifically proven thing. I know it sounds crazy, but it goes way beyond vanity and materialism. Presentation is important. And I just got on my soapbox. So <laughs> we're gonna move. <laughs> did, did I answer your question though? Well, okay, so back to Steve Jobs. I'm sorry, I got on a soapbox. But, but that, was, that was his choice for presentation because he said, I have too many other decisions to make in my life and I know that I will present professionally in this shirt and these pants every day and I don't have to make a decision about it. Yes, it did. It definitely became his identity. You got known for that. I think he paid for that because he didn't have a really great relationship with his daughter. And he also didn't really have a great relationship with his illness as, as well. There were things that he could have done to um, prolong his life or, or circumvent his demise as, as, as well. Um, instead of going with a certain level of conventional medicine, he went a very um, streamlined, holistic route as well. And I do think at the end of his life, one of his regrets was that he did not build a better relationship with his daughter. And I, and I do think his clothes reflected who he was. He was just all about business, all about focusing on this one end goal constantly over and over and over again. And it's gonna be interesting to see how his looks at him moving forward that 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 is going to be the only image of him is him in that black turtleneck for all eternity you know and so that's going to be an interesting play moving forward in how people perceive him as this sort of um, singular bandwidth guy you know that People don't, it's like Napoleon with the hat or him with his hand in his vest or something like that. You're just sort of burned into the minds of people for all eternity that way, too. Because Steve Jobs is someone that is going to affect humanity for hundreds of years to come long after he's gone as well. And it's going to be his black turtleneck is his logo, essentially. Um, as, as well. So a sort of eclectic or a sort of um, varied sense of style too, where you have different looks that does help your, your, your sort of um, portfolio <laughs> as how people perceive you as, as, as well. Like think about Madonna is, you know, we have different incarnations of Madonna in different eras of her pop culture career as, as well. She's not remembered for one particular look. She's remembered for many different looks as, as well. No. But people will care. It will, it will, it will. Let Elon wear the wrong thing. If Elon, if he wears the wrong thing, it may come back to haunt him. I think ultimately he can be. I think that that is very plausible depending on which direction that his company goes or the vision of what he's trying to do. You know, I, I, I do think that that is a part of how people perceive people. People perceive John F. Kennedy as a very well-dressed man as well. People have given, you know, a lot of attention to certain presidents based on the length of their tie, too, where people start to focus on these things, you know, right or wrong, fair or not. And, you know, fashion lives in its own universe as, as well. You know, so for the time being, maybe people don't really pay that much attention to Elon Musk, but I would like to challenge that by Googling it. If you Google Elon Musk and fashion, be interesting to see what you come up with and has there any, been any real uh, critique of uh, how he presents. Because he is a, a, a very... Um, unusual fellow as, as far as how he makes decisions in his life and certainly what he names his children. And to your point, like 
there's always going to be two camps to everything or multiple camps. Um, the goal is to open the idea of how you can utilize things in your everyday life in a different manner and how, you know, take what serves you, leave what doesn't. Um, talking back on film, film, because this is your space, I would love for you to share examples of characters that have had a significant impact in our society and our culture and how it has shaped how we feel about either society as a whole or your self-image things, positive, negative, just kind of how film has impacted the way we see ourselves in culture. I think there's a dividing line. I, I, I think it comes down to one film in the, the, the era that we live in versus all things before, and that's the movie Clueless. Clueless is, it's literally the beginning of this whole other universe of youth culture, fashion, sense of self, female empowerment, technology, where those characters in that film, you cared what they were wearing. And those characters in that film as those characters cared what they were wearing. And that was something that became extraordinarily significant with people and very identifiable. And I think that's an example of an era in what we consider to be the modern era. There is before Clueless and there is after Clueless. And that's how we think about the universe. I mean, when you talk to a lot of people who have been born or grown up and know the latter half of the 90s and the 2000s, they don't care about anything that happened before Clueless. They have no interest at all. It's kind of funny. But then from that point, you can go back in time again, and there are these other dividing lines. You know, Easy Rider is another one. And it's the, it's the fashion, it's the look, it's the feel um, as well. And then you can go back again and you can go back to Rebel Without a Cause. And there it is again. You know, these, these moments in time come up all the time and they, they generally move from decade to, to decade as, as well where they define, they define the times and they define how people look all the way back to the 20s and the flappers and all this other stuff. And then once media moved. It was beyond just paintings and stills and it, suddenly it came to life. People looked on screen, they saw things and they're like, I want to be that. That's how I want to, that's how I want to be. You know, whether it was like a giant zoot suit and a big hat or whatever, that's what people wanted to do and that's what people wanted to, to be. And that does define how people um, perceive themselves as well. I think since Clueless things haven't necessarily hit something that we can say, wow, here's another defining moment in our culture where fashion takes over, tells story, and defines who we are. I think we're still, uh -oh, a hand. I'll give you that. Um, it, it, it's an interesting aspect with, with Lady Gaga because she did it and then it kind of stopped as well. Like she's moved into, a different space where she's almost like become a part of, it's not the status quo, but sort of a classic established sensibility. You know, she's become high society, which is great. You know, Lady Gaga is extraordinarily talented or whatever. But as much as she was so radicalized in the beginning, that changed over time. Here is an interesting footnote about Lady Gaga. You know who financed Lady Gaga in the beginning? Akon. That's Akon money. That is straight out of the ATL. He saw something in her and he put the money in her for her to be able to move forward. And at that particular time, she was very interested in drawing attention to herself. And once again, an, an example of fashion, you know, you hang meat on yourself, that's gonna draw attention <laughs> to yourself. But that particular edgy sensibility as she continued, you know, she ended up like singing with Tony Bennett and moving on and then doing a, a film, you know, that is a classic film in Hollywood that's been done many different times as well. So she is cemented in, in Hollywood classic culture now. 
you know, so her demands for fashion now are high fashion, classic fashion. Is what well. I don't think she can hang meat on herself anymore. Even if she wanted to, I don't think she could get away with it. She would have some publicist, several publicists, probably a gang of publicists. They would all tackle her. She would never get out of the dressing room now. Absolutely, without with, without question. You know, there's you know, and you you see it too on the other the dissemination side. I mean, if anyone follows Britney Spears on Instagram. Right. It's a train wreck. <laughs> so it's all gone. I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there, there's nothing there. You know, one of the things that you would want her to do to resuscitate her career is literally put some clothes on. But also to find something that flatters her as a, an attractive middle-aged woman rather than a middle-aged woman trying to hang on to this weird sense about what she thinks youth is. tech industry that really care about fashion as, as well. And there is a, there's definitively a cross-sectionality between technology and the entertainment industry as well. And there is a lot of money from tech that's in the entertainment industry. And a lot of people in tech are buying a lot of content-based companies as well. And you see a lot of tech guys walking around in peg leg jeans. <laughs> so they do kind of care about their images in tech as, as, as well. It's, it's not as much anymore of they, they just kind of show up in a t-shirt or whatever and they kind of look whatever. They are becoming a little bit more competitive on the fashion end too. And there is sort of a, a fashion sensibility about people in the, in the tech industry, especially ones that have done really well. They've cashed out for $100 million or whatever. You know, they're hanging out in the south of France and they're wearing expensive suits and stuff like that. So it's fascinating, but fashion's always there. But to your point, you know, it, it never goes away. It always exists in entertainment and it does leak into these other industries. Um, as well, and including politics too. Like people care what people look like. People dr trashed and dragged Hillary Clinton when she would, you know, was running for a political office about what she was wearing, what her hair looked like, and things like that as well. And I and I and I thought that that was kind of out of bounds for a, a political person. But at the end of the day, that's the game we play. You, if you're gonna run for president, you should probably look good. So I think I think the the interesting thing in this conversation is you can clearly see the intersectionality of these things and how they influence each other. And yes, to your point, we were talking a lot about the entertainment industry because the entertainment industry is so modeled through it bleeds into the everyday culture. And so a lot of things that are going on in like our children's lives are coming from these industries and they're molding from that. And I think the point for me is to understand how can you utilize these things to serve you? Maybe 
it will never be that. But to also understand the reality is image is so powerful. We, we cannot get away from that. You guys are consuming 10,000 images a day or more. And there are, there are triggers in your brain. It's, it's, it's how it works. And it's how, um, let me give you an example. Maybe we'll, um, uniforms. Uniforms are a powerful example. And I say this because they elicit emotions from people. So you think about, um, I was a kid growing up in the 90s and I lived in rural Texas and I didn't get packages. Amazon wasn't a thing yet. Getting packages at the house was super, super rare. And so anytime I saw the UPS truck going down my rural road, I was like sitting in front of the window hoping, turn in my driveway, turn in my driveway, turn in my driveway, it's a package. Like it was so exciting. And so now anytime I see somebody in a UPS uniform, I'm like, this is so exciting. It's like, it's a package all over again but they elicit emotions. Same thing for people that might have had an experience one way or another with a cop. They're going to have an emotion that is elicited from that person in that uniform. So what my point is, if you are not wearing a uniform, you're still eliciting emotions from people and are you in control of it? Um, so. Yes, same thing. It is, but do you know how that translates later in life? My clients, they don't know how to find themselves. They don't know how to translate that into their, their new careers outside of that space. And I end up having to coach a lot of people about the fear of standing out, the fear of owning their authenticity, the fear of owning their skill because they're so in, like, subconsciously ingrained and taught how to blend in. And there's, I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong in, in schools, but it does have, everything has a cause and effect. And so there is one thing that happens and there's another thing that happens and you have to be aware of those cause and effects. And, and that to me is the point of understanding, like for me, how powerful fashion can be and and the entertainment industry because it bleeds into our society. It what reaches everybody regardless of who you are. And it shapes how we think, feel about ourselves and our culture. So. It may, it may, but not everybody has big traumas. Sometimes they're subtle. And so we have to also acknowledge those. Um, so I just wanna, we are at time. I love this engaging conversation. I'm gonna have you, <laughs> I um, am gonna ask you for one quick success story success. in film that you feel created a positive, helped you with positive image. The Benetton ads um, that were in the early 1990s. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, before that particular time in advertising, it, and I'm just going to just cut through the bone here. Advertising was very compartmentalized. We did not see people of all different sizes, shapes, colors, backgrounds um, presenting together. And Benetton was the first time that we ever really saw that. And that was one of the most powerful ads that I had ever seen in my life where I, I saw different people of different backgrounds wearing clothes from a, the same brand at the same time in a picture. And then fast forward to now, we actually see advertising with women of all shape, sizes, and colors as well. And that is extraordinarily significant because that is a proper representation of who we are as a society. We are a society of diverse people from all different backgrounds from all over the world. And advertising has lagged behind in that for generations. And finally, we've gotten to the point where it's pretty normal now. We don't think too much about it. It seems like it's a regular thing that happens all the time. And those are the types of things that using fashion, once again, empowers people 
because maybe a girl that is a little bit more of a plus size sees some sort of representation of herself and she says, hey, I belong. Or we have one kid's Indian, one kid's Persian, one kid's white, one kid's black, one kid's Asian, and they're all hanging out together and they're wearing cool clothes and it says, hey, we can all hang out together too. That's very powerful as well. And so there's a lot of messages that can be brought to the discourse of our society that are very positive um, for everyone. That, that, that don't have to be preachy, don't have to be wordy, don't have to be over the top. And this is the power of fashion and this is the thing that people forget. And I know that people drag fashion sometimes and they think it doesn't matter. It does. Because what it does is it brings people together and it allows everyone on every level to participate. And it is the only thing that we do in this country that is creative and artistic. When you go to a fashion show, you can't have a problem with anybody. You can't walk into a fashion show and say, I don't like this person or that person, or I don't like the orientation of that person, I don't like the, it's not gonna work. Fashion is the only venue that we have that is sort of resilient and Teflon to these other types of agendas that orbit around us in society that say like, no, you can't do that. In fashion, you can do anything and you can do everything and you can be exactly who you want and you can present any way that you want to be as well. And it is inclusive of everyone at all times. And I think that's one of the things that I find to be amazing. And the Benetton ad would be the one for me where I think it's one of the greatest points in the history of advertising and entertainment where that image, when I first time I saw that, it was at a very influential time in my life. It changed my life. It made me feel like I belonged and that I could continue on and be the best person that I am. Awesome, I love it. Um, does anybody, we have time for maybe like one, maybe two other questions. Anybody have a question they'd like to ask or a statement they'd like to share? Knowledge is power. You have a question? Oh. The young lady there that's sitting in the background that is still in school. <laughs> do, do you have any question at all, being in this room full of adults? I know it's terrible. I get it. It's not? It's okay? You're good? Wow, that's impressive. That, it, that, that, that you are truly a mature person and in 10 years, can I have a job? Okay, good, thank you. I will come work for you. Um, do you have any questions about this? Is there anything that you think about this? You go to school, you are around other kids, you guys judge each other for everything. What you look like and what you're wearing and the walk and the talk and who's cool and who's ugly and all of this other stuff. And you have to get up every day and decide what you're gonna wear in order to get through your day and to keep people from bothering you so you can just get through your day because you live in the hell of school and you can't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel that someday you're going to graduate and you're going to go to college and you're gonna go out in the real world, which is like 20 minutes away, but it doesn't seem like it. And then you have a whole nother life of like 80 years after that. How do you handle all of that? Hi. Um, we wear uniforms at my school, so there's not too much variation. But um, with different events, people will generally wear a similar type of thing, but with maybe colors no one has done before. And so you're matching everyone and not standing out, but you're standing out slightly. And that's usually what brings like compliments and stuff. Oh, yeah. So we have a rule at our school. When you're wearing a skirt, it has to be three inches or less above the knee, but all the girls like to be special and roll their <laughs> skirt. Um, so I'm one of the kids who don't roll their skirt. And so it does bring me attention. <laughs> it does bring me attention, but people have gotten to know that as one of my identities, I'm just the kid who wears a long skirt. And people have come to accept that, so yeah.
No, I, I love that. And I think that's super empowering. So you hold on to that, my dear Emily. That is a gift um, that I haven't always had. Uh, <laughs> hello, Hollywood. No, anyway. <laughs> We're not going to go down that tangent right now. That's for the after show. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, all that's left for me to do is to roll out the red carpet for you. Tell the people how they can find you, how they can connect with you, what's coming next for you. Thank you for being our very esteemed guest this evening. Um, oh, yes. Hello, beautiful people. So, I'm not sure if Aliyah was before Clueless or not, but I had to mention this because I'm a Korean woman and I have my Korean version of Aliyah, who in the 90s did not have a door knocker earring, Tommy Hilfiger boxers, and baggy pants that are sweeping the streets of NYC. I'm from New York, right? We all had that. So this is gonna lead to my question. Now that's coming back, the oversized fleece, the oversized jeans, the Jankos, I mean, they're all coming back. And this is me trying to be my cool aunt with my niece who's um, just turned 12 years old and she's complaining to me. Oh my gosh, I can't believe at school we can't wear um, spaghetti straps. That's the, you know, it has to be thicker than two fingers. I was like, like literally like, like this. She goes, yeah, the straps have to be thicker and I don't like, you know, wearing those because she likes to dress baggy because that's what the cool kids wear. So the question for you, Fred, is, you know, as adults, when we want to connect with our children, because right now social media um, does, you know, what it does, and it does deliver a lot of positive impact. At the same time, it makes it a little more difficult at times to connect. Like we go out and have family outings and the kids are on the phone. And I try to use fashion to connect with my niece. I'll whip out that picture of me, you know, with the Aliyah fashion. I'm like, that was auntie. Do you, I was just like, oh my God, that's you. I'm like, yeah, I used to be cool too. <laughs> so how would you say, you know, how can we use fashion and, and film and all these things to start a dialogue where the kids don't feel like, you know, the aunt or the mom and dad is like not cool anymore. Like I'll show pictures of my brother in Jenko jeans and my niece is like, that was that. I'm like, yeah, that was daddy. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the evolution of fashion. It's your level of fashion knowledge. I mean, you want to be able to sit down with the, um, kids in your life that you are influencing, that you are raising in the village that you live in, um, and show them that fashion's been a big deal for a hundred years. And that this is something that evolves and is an evolution, and you're, they're only a part of the evolutionary chain. As much as they think they are the bomb, that is temporary. And it's, it's a really good life learning lesson about everything in life. Everything in life is temporary. It, it is literally here today, gone tomorrow. They can't believe that what they're doing now will become old. You know, I once had parachute pants and could break dance. And I thought that that was the end of the world. Nothing else was going to happen. That was it. Thank you. Um, but that's not true. I mean, the world keeps moving forward. So it's a really great opportunity. And this is what I do, because I have my little nieces and nephews and things like that too. And so I really try to focus into those spaces of this is really great now, but it's gonna continue to move forward. Enjoy it as much as you can. Get as much as you can out of it. And for my friend here as well, enjoy your life. Enjoy your youth. Be proud of who you are. Stand tall because these are some of the most important moments in your life that are going to formulate who you will become as an adult. Now, I told the story about that thriller jacket. I wore the crap out of that thriller jacket too. And I didn't care what anybody said. I was embarrassed in my parents and everybody else and I didn't care. I wore it everywhere I went. And you know what it did? It made me the person I am today, that I'm proud of who I am. 
And I think that's what's really important. And those are the things that you kind of emphasize with these kids. You kind of lean into it. That's what they want to do. But also with fashion, you have the discussion about here are the sort of parameters for different venues that you operate in, like at school or in other places. So if you're not allowed to wear the spaghetti strap, you can't wear the spaghetti strap here. And you have to understand that because there are many things that we cannot do in certain venues. Like if the speed limit's 65, go 65, you know? And so it's important to teach people parameters and limits as well. And with fashion and especially with youth, it's a tremendous opportunity to do that as well. So I try to look at it as teaching moments. And I have, I mean, I have, you know, nieces and stuff like that. And I mean, and they start looking like ladies by the time they're 13 and you're just like, oh my God. And I'm like, you know, please, you know, and, and you, you have to coach them into a space for growth and to also protect themselves too. I mean, these things are very important and they're very complicated. So you just have to take time with them. You know, you kind of get out of your world and you get into their world. And I, and I think sometimes as adults, we become so consumed with ourselves that we forget about the other people around us that we need to take more time with. And many of us as adults always look back on our lives as kids and we're always thinking, I wish somebody had taken more time with me. I wish somebody had talked to me. So here's the opportunity for us to do that. And that's kind of how I look at it as well. But that's a terrific question too. And I, I commend you on that, that you take an interest in, in them. And that will mean something to them when they grow up and they'll come back to you as they're pushing your wheelchair around. And they'll say, you know, I really appreciated you saying something to, to me, you know, and those were some of the things that I related to the people that influenced me when I was growing up as a kid as well. And, they, and the ones that never told me to take off the thriller jacket. Like I've got aunties that are very old now and they laugh. They're just like, you just walked around with that thriller jacket on all the time. You just thought you were somebody, didn't you? And, you know, and we wanted to say something, but we didn't because it just made you so happy. It made you happy. And we don't have enough happiness in life in general anyway. So what little bit we can get, give it to them. Wear the thriller jacket. <sighs> yeah, no, I, I, it is teaching moments. There's a, we're gonna find this. There will be a photo shoot later. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, because I can and I have the mic. I, I, real quick, there is a movie um, called Begin Again. Uh, it's Keira Knightley and Brandon Ruffalo. But there is a scene in there. It's a young teenage girl, and she is struggling to fit in at school, and she thinks that wearing a certain type of clothing is going to help her fit in. And there is a teaching moment where this mentor, she's not the mom, she's not technically an aunt, but she's kind of a mentor in the space, takes her shopping and shows how to utilize fashion to fit today's culture, but it doesn't have to be provocative to, to fit her age. And I think it, it really does boil down to the teaching moments and how can you meet people where they're at, regardless of age. And, and understanding that, you know, um, what you mentioned, like teaching moments of like, this is the appropriate time to wear this and this is not. It's something I call image IQ, which I'm gonna make the blanket statement that our culture really struggles with right now. <laughs> But it's, it's understanding that you can be authentic and show up as yourself, but there's a way to do that appropriately at work. There's a way to do that appropriate at school, in your off time, in brunch with your friends or whatever the occasion might be. But to be able to stay grounded in yourself and your confidence in your image enough to just be yourself, but do it appropriately in the setting. And I think that's a very valuable lesson you can teach as well. So on that note, because you guys have been wonderful, attentive, I appreciate all the amazing questions. Tell everybody how they can find you, connect, all the things. If you guys have not yet, please scan this and it'll just give you once a month email notifications of when these things are happening, the conversation that's coming up. We would love you have to be a part of it. Thank you guys all so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for, for coming. I'm going to pass you out things that are me. Um, this is a film that I'm 
currently circulating is called Where is America the Beautiful? And that person that you see on this particular flyer is that person sitting right there. To me. Yes. This is another film, um, and this has all the information about where you can find me as well. Uh, this is another film that is circulating. It's uh, playing in Europe. That film is playing in America. This is called Pre-Existing Freedom. Again, it is all about the world that we live in. And then this is a general flyer that just has me on it as well, being silly as well. So I'm going to leave these things around. You're awesome, kiddo. Way to be yourself. That matters. You don't got one. <laughs> Yep, there you go. So, yes. So, and everything is, um, it's Frederick, it's F-R-3-D-E-R, -E the number one C-K. That will get you everything. You Google that, you'll get everything that is me. I am the number one F-R-3-D-E-R, one C-K on Google as well. Um, you can, yeah, you can, you can track me if you wish. So that sort of matrix-like code will get you everything about me as well. And I'm always open to answer questions about anything. Please ask. I think I'm hanging out for a little bit. Um, yeah, we're going to eat food, I think. Um, unless this place is closing. Is it closing? What, nine. Okay, so we're going to be open for a little bit. So please come up, ask me any questions that you like. And if you're ever in Atlanta or downtown, um, our company is at the corner of 25th and Peachtree. You're always welcome to come by and say hello uh, as, as well. And um, can we have a hand for Casey, please? I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important that people help other people to build self-confidence in themselves, and she is committed to this as a business, which I find to be extraordinary um, as, as well. And I and I don't want that to drift into the background with this uh, as as well. And I think it's really important that we all do something to help each other. And re please remember that deeds is the only currency. Thank you very much, and have a great evening. while we pause for a brief commercial break. Picture this. Picture that. Picture laughter. Picture travel. Picture magic. Picture dance. Picture family. Picture struggle. Picture bravery. Picture today. Picture tomorrow. Watch Tomorrow Pictures on Film On. Roller skates at the bottom of the stairs. Poorly insulated wires near the bathtub. Okay. Looks like a sound check's about to happen.